Welcome everyone. My name is Colleen. I lead the programming for the battery. We're so glad you could join us tonight virtually for this conversation. Um, we are recording this and we will be sharing it after the fact um, on our YouTube channel and you'll get an email with that. But it's my pleasure to introduce our talk tonight, Betraying the Noble Secrets of Corruption in the World's Most Prestigious Award. Um, we're, welcome, we're joined by Uni Tertini, the author of the book. The book just came out November 3rd, I believe. Um, so we'll make sure to drop a link in the chat for you if you're interested in exploring that. And she is joined tonight by Brian Keating, who is the author of Losing the Nobel Prize. Um, between the two of them, they've got a lot of information and knowledge on this subject. So I'm really looking forward to um, the discussion tonight. Um, so I'll hand it over to Uni. Oh, Uni, you're muted. Let me unmute you. There you go. There, there. Okay, thank you so much, Colleen. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, hi, Brian. I'm so honored to, to have this conversation with you. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's actually been five years uh, now in November since I was at the, at the Battery um, giving a talk on my last book, The Mystery of the Lone Wolf Killer. Um, about these um, lone wolf mass killers uh, around the world. And um, I'm so honored to be here. And I just want to shout out also to, I forgot to mention that I have some uh, good friends and, and, and relatives, Max and Louise, who are members at the club. And I don't know if you're watching right now or if you're, you will be watching the recording later. Um, but um, yeah, so to say hello. Um, and I think let's, uh, I'll, I wanted to begin with a, just a short reading from the introduction of my book, just to set up the conversation uh, of why, um, why I'm doing this and why this, why the Nobel Peace Prize matters uh, in the world today um, with lack of lack of trust in leadership globally. So I think it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a great conversation um, to have right now, especially in the US with the polarization um, in society. And, and it's not only in the US, it's also elsewhere. So, um, so I think it's an important conversation. So thank you so much for being here and listening and I look forward to your questions. So introduction, prize and paradox. No other prize holds more prestige than the Nobel. An aura of admiration surrounds it. As 1984 winner Desmond Tutu put it, no sooner had I got the Nobel Peace Prize than I became an instant oracle. Virtually everything I said before was now received with something like awe. No other award is followed by just about every country in the world and commented on by just about every newspaper and television network. However, the Nobel Peace Prize as we know it is corrupt at its core. The prize, Gary Lindestad said to the Norwegian television station in 2014, has not become renowned because the award rewards the Red Cross and Nelson Mandela, but rather because of its controversial choices. Controversial choices are fine as long as the committee as, as executors of Alfred Nobel's last will sticks to his instructions. Nobel wanted the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee to select peace champions to act as role models for the rest of us. Naming someone a peace champion then is a risky business. First, the committee's choice may not be everyone's cup of tea or have the most convenient pol political leanings. Second, the committee cannot predict how a Nobel laureate will behave in the aftermath of the prize. What if the winner doesn't turn out to be the beacon of hope and inspiration the committee had hoped for? Thus, the committee must show courage and conviction in their choices because history will reflect back to them and their choices, making it all the more vital that the committee research their candidates properly. The Norwegian Nobel Committee, Lundestad said, must dare to speak when others don't. No matter how honorable his statement is, many, including Michael Nobel, the great grandson of Ludwig Nobel, Alfred's brother, believe the committee has created its own prize. 
A prize not necessarily with peace in mind, nor one that selects winners in accordance with Alfred Nobel's last will. Selecting winner who, winners who are clearly not peace champions creates distrust. But the Nobel Peace Prize as an institution isn't alone in this. Today, trust in leadership is also at a historic low in governments and corporations. Um, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg has repeatedly put profit above his customers' privacy concerns, uh, most, infam most infamously, infamously by sharing user data with the now defunct Cambridge Analytica, Analytica political firm. Um, Amazon's Jeff Bezos is another example of, of greedy leadership. Um, an increasing rage is spreading worldwide as lower and middle class citizens feel ignored, taken advantage of, and abused. The Yellow Vest protest in France started in November 2018 when about 280 thousand people took to the streets in cities across the country to push back against a proposed tax increase, which according to the protesters, is part of a scheme run by President Emmanuel Macron and his government to favor the wealthy to the detriment of the lower and middle class populations. The demonstrations that erupted at the 2019 World Economic Forum in Davos Switzerland over corporate power and economic inequality reflect that same rage. Um, Asia has also seen uprisings. A movement of protests that began in Hong Kong in June 2019 over an extra extradition bill to mainline China, which was feared to threaten Hong Kong's judicial independence and endanger dissidents. Although the bill was withdrawn in, in September 2019, the demonstrations continue as of this writing in June 2020, despite COVID-19 social distancing rules, demanding full democracy and an inquiry into police actions. Meanwhile, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to cause people around the world to fall grievously ill. Similarly, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee is showing an example of leadership that is divisive instead of unifying. Instead of making the bold choices our world needs, it has fallen into the temptation of power and politics. It has been swayed by popularity and fame instead of standing up for the values of the Nobel Peace Prize, Alfred Nobel's intentions of peace and unity. As a consequence, unworthy candidates have been chosen and other more deserving ones, including Mahatma Gandhi, have been ignored. The committee betrayal, committee's betrayal may not always have been intentional. Since Alfred Nobel's death in 1896, our societies have changed and so has warfare. My book will examine how the committee has widened the scope of Nobel's prize and the inconsistencies that have led to criticism. Before people and organizations are put on pedestals, especially one as lofty as the Nobel, it is imperative to examine what those pedestals rest on. Only then will we know the true worth of a prize. By shining light on today's dysfunctions and proposing a solution, my hope is that betraying the Nobel can be a catalyst for change, not only in the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, but for the rest of us to step up and become the peace champions our local and global environment needs. And I think I'll end it there. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a, such a powerful book. It had a huge effect on me. I'm so honored to be speaking with you. Uh, an honor I would gladly exchange my chocolate covered Nobel Prize uh, for. Uh, and I wanna acknowledge how heroic it is of Uni to be joining us all the way from Norway at this ungodly hour. I said she should become an astronomer like me. She's good at staying up late. Uh, Brian Keating, as you heard, author of Losing the Nobel Prize. And it's my honor to be speaking again with Uni. Uh, we had an interview on my podcast channel, my YouTube channel. You can check that out uh, for some interactive graphics on the Nobel Prize. But I want to start with the fact that to this, to me, to my mind, this book is a, is a masterful story that's told really from the perspective 
as Uni is, of an attorney with the eye of, of a journalist, of an investigative reporter, but also very, very, um, very tender and, and its approach to this really mythological character, not only in the sciences, but also in literature and especially in peace. And that's Alfred Nobel. He's very mysterious. He was a hermit, but he was outgoing. He wanted to change the world and make the world better. And some say atone for some of the atrocities mentioned in his name. And Uni does a phenomenal job characterizing uh, some of the winners that have uh, failed to live up to the lofty visions he had for redemption of the Nobel name. You may know Alfred Nobel invented dynamite and 354 uh, other patents, but none made him richer, or wealthier than dynamite. And I found it fascinating and I didn't know this. And I wrote a whole book about uh, the Nobel prizes. And she talks about his perspective as a human being, as a man with interest and love interest. And I thought maybe we'd start there uh, mm -hmm. with Uni, with your perspective on him as a person and what it would be like to have, uh, I always wanted to have a dinner party with Alfred Nobel. What do you think yeah. that would be like, given his very complex relationships with, with women, especially? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's the, one of the parts of the book that I, that I really um, enjoyed writing. And I think a lot of this is not known to the general public about Alfred Nobel. And I was lucky enough to, um, to work with uh, Michael Nobel on this book, who is um, a descendant of one of Alfred's brothers. And he wrote the foreword to, to my book as well. And so he could share some of his insights as well on, into his, um, uh, his great, great grand uncle or something. Um, Alfred was a lonely, he was, you know, extremely brilliant and, uh, and could be social, absolutely. And he, he ran his business masterfully and traveled the world and spoke so many different languages. And he, um, he was Swedish, but he settled um, to live at the, you know, sort of the end of his life in Paris. And, um, or, and I would say the last sort of 20 years or so in Paris. And he was 43 at the time and he was lonely. He had been so busy um, inventing and uh, working so hard. And he really wanted to um, find someone to marry. And, but he didn't have a lot of, you know, his social skills were somewhat lacking. So he, um, and he could also be quite arrogant. Um, he wrote to his brother, Robert, that he thought that the Parisians, the Parisian women were stupid. Um, the Russian women were more intelligent, but they had an antipathy to soap. So he didn't like the Russian women. And so what he did was he put a, an ad in the paper and in, in an Austrian newspaper in Vienna that he needed um, a, a sort of personal assistant slash secretary, but really he was looking for a wife. It was an ad for a, for a, for a companion, for a wife. And, um, and this young woman, I'm sure there were many people who responded because he was quite well known at the time and very wealthy. Um, but this one woman um, who responded, she was, um, her name was Bertha. Um, and she was, uh, came from a very sort of noble and, and, and known family in Austria, but the, her family didn't have any money. So she had to work for a living. And because of her, her um, high class manners and education, she got a job as a nanny for the wealthy uh, von Suttner family in Austria. And the eldest son in the von Suttner family fell in love with her and she fell in love with him. So, um, and <laughs> of course, um, Mrs. von Suttner uh, did not agree to this relationship. And so she wanted to um, get Bertha away from the family. So she uh, sort of forced Bertha to respond to, to this ad, this weird ad in the newspaper. And she did, and she got the job and she uh, left Vienna for Paris and she started working for Alfred Nobel. And they had lots of conversations, um, great conversations because she was really interested in society, in the world, in politics and, and all the things that, that Alfred was interested in, in literature. Um, and he soon fell in love with her. And then when she realized that a couple of weeks into um, 
her, her coming to Paris, she felt that she couldn't stay. So she left, she told him, listen, I'm already in love with someone else. And then she left and went back to Vienna, actually got married to the von Suttner's son and they were uh, thrown out of the family and, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, rejected and had to, you know, to, to live in poverty for like about 10 years, I think, before they were welcomed back into the family again. Um, but she and Alfred stayed in touch over the years and were really good friends. And they wrote letters and numerous letters to one another. And they also even met. And Bertha would become um, one of the pioneers in the peace movement back in, back in those days. She wrote a book, a best-selling um, book called Lay Down Your Arms. She held... Um, uh, peace conferences that Alfred Nobel supported financially and also attended in person. So they were very much um, uh, in conversation about peace, but he hadn't been really this involved before. So when he wrote his last will, I mean, he didn't, he'd never married, he never had any children of his own. So, he, you know, he was, he, and he wanted his money to make a difference when he died. So when he uh, fi finalized his last will and sent it to her, um, she was very touched because she realized that he had dedicated a big chunk of his money to the cause of peace, um, to all of these five prizes in physics, chemistry, medicine, uh, literature, and then peace. But it was really the peace prize the, that was really a declaration of his love and respect to her. So it's a beaut it's really a beautiful story, uh, Brian, and it's um, and it's kind of sad as well because and she was actually um, the first female um, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. She won in in uh, 1905, and she should have been probably the first to win, but um, she was a woman, and back in those days, it wasn't you know usual to give these prestigious prizes to women, so she had to wait for five years, but she got it. And it's really kind of sad, kind of sad when we know, um, well, I, from, from the research that I did and I, and I really, my, concern, my, my, my question when I started this research was, what did Alfred Nobel intend with his prize? What were his values and his intentions? And what has the Peace Prize become? So that was really uh, my quest. And when I discovered sort of what, what has happened to the prize, it's, it's really kind of sad because he had the best of intentions with his prize. He really wanted um, for um, courageous leaders to be awarded. He really wanted the Peace Prize to be a beacon of hope and inspiration to the rest of us, right? Yeah, and he wanted that, you know, as well for the other prizes, but I point out, you know, yeah. it's, it's so funny when you're writing a book and you know, I was writing my book before yours and I secretly wished that I could meet someone who was an attorney to help me prosecute the case against the executors of Alfred Nobel's will because one of the uh, requirements in the will and the stipulations is that even for the science prizes, that it, they should go to only those who have bettered mankind. Yeah. And I think that shows the heterodox nature of the Nobel Prize and what I call the ethical will. So he gave away money, but he also gave away what his ethical bequeathments were. I don't know if that's even a word, but but anyway, to the to the to the, to the all of humanity. And I think it's it's quite fascinating that even in the science prizes, he wanted to make the world better. And of course, no prize, as I agree with you, is closer to his heart than the prize given out in Norway. And you know, I think we all think of Norway, you know, in the same way you must think of Norway, the same way we think of Canada. So wh why is it that, uh, why is it that Nor uh, Sweden's Canada is, is part of, uh, is part of the prize at all? Alfred Nobel was, was known as, you know, Russian Rockefeller or Swedish Rockefeller. What, what does it have to do with Norway whatsoever? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question, Brian. Um, and it's a question that we actually don't have the answer to. Um, but, you know, we can make an educated guess, and that's what I did in my book, um, because back in, the, back in those days, more than 100 years ago, Norway was in union with Sweden, meaning that Sweden was actually governing Norway. Norway did not have its, its own 
um, military uh, power. Um, it hadn't had its own military uh, power since the Vikings, you know, since all the way back then, and was not at all involved in politics in, in, in Europe or, or any sort of power struggle. It was this sort of very poor, uh, remote uh, country um, and was sort of led by first by the Danish and then by the Swedes, Swedes and but it was desperate to break free. And Norway had its own government, but that was sort of like a sub-government to the Swedish. And the Norwegian government had shown um, some support to the peace cause and to Bertha von Suttner and uh, had done some, some of these things, but it wasn't involved at all in the sort of the power politics in the game in Europe or in Scandinavia at all. So um, I believe that Alfred Nobel wanted his prize to be, especially the Peace Prize, to be um, independent and to be so, sort of set aside from the dangers of, of power politics. So, you know, that's, that's what um, I believe and also what I've uh, read and heard from other uh, historians and experts that that's why he gave Norway the Peace Prize. But it wasn't well uh, well received. I mean, Sweden, the Swedish king, he got very very upset um, because of this you know big chunk chunk of money being sort of sent out of Sweden to be you know administered by by Norway. Um, it wasn't well received, and uh, Norway, of course, was thrilled. Um, he gave the, the the mission to the Norwegian Parliament to select the five members of the committee. And, um, and they were thrilled, of course. And perhaps, you know, the Peace Prize even added to, um, added a bit of confidence to the Norwegians because um, not, not long after, he, Alfred Nobel died in, in, uh, in 1896 and, um, uh, and in 1905, actually the, the year that Berth von Suttner won the prize, um, Norway actually managed to obtain independence and has been independent ever since. So, so maybe it's sort of added to a bit of boost, you know, boosting the confidence of Norway. Who knows? Right. Yeah, we can only speculate on that. And speaking of confidence or lack thereof, I don't know. Um, it always amuses me recently when I see articles, especially those that quote you and in, in the book of betraying the Nobel, and they reference the uh, possible future winner who is currently the occupant of the Oval Office, Donald Trump. I don't know if I can say that in something broadcast in San Francisco. Let's hope we can. Uh, but nevertheless, it strikes me as, uh, as quite ironic that the, you know, leader of the free world, you know, who has the, this, this immense amount of power spent a good deal of this past year lobbying, advocating, preening, and, and so forth uh, for his inclusion uh, amidst the laureates of a uh, Nobel grandeur. What do you make of that? That uh, first of all, that someone with as much power, attention, prestige uh, could, could sort of want to sacrifice everything to win something even more, a golden graven medallion given out by uh, the King of Norway. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been fascinating and I've had to respond, you know, to, to quite a few journalists on, you know, what do you think will happen? Is Trump gonna, you know, are, is, is he gonna win? And and so he's uh, nominated for next year's prize, um, along with Vladimir Putin, might I add. So that's a, that's gonna be an interesting year. Um, so so and both of them are actually lobbying and um, you know advocating for themselves to to win this prize, which is really funny. Um, and he was the first nomination that um, Trump received uh, for next year's prize was by a Norwegian uh, member of parliament. So it's kind of, you know, funny because Trump is not a president that is well um, regarded in the Norwegian or European political elites. Um, the, the Norwegian prime minister has, has declared that she found that it's, you know, she was, she was relieved when, when it turned out that Biden Receive more votes. I don't think he's been declared um, the winner yet. I don't know, but um, anyway, they are relieved and they're hoping, of course, it's going to be Biden. Um, and just because it, he was an unpredictable leader to to deal with. 
Um, and, uh, and um, but the, the Norwegian parliamentarian that actually uh, nominated him, he did so, I believe, I mean, he has a point because President Trump has actually managed to to, to seal some deals and uh, agreements between countries, between the, the, the Serbians and, 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 and Serbs and, and uh, Serbia and Kosovo, also in the Middle East. Now, I also believe that, that um, uh, the, um, the recognition of Saudi Arabia of Israel came along with uh, an arms deal uh, as well on the back of that. So, I mean, there's something there, but anyway, the deal is done and, and Israel has been recognized by, and now more and more countries, uh, Muslim countries um, <clears throat> are recognizing Israel. So he has accomplished something. And I think the point that this parliamentarian wanted to make was that look at all these other people that you have uh, declared peace champions. They haven't done, um, they haven't done all the things that they, or they, they're not as qualified as, as President Trump. And one example is, is Barack Obama. Now, Barack Obama, he was, that was really when I started digging into the Peace Prize. That was back in 2009 when he was um, not, when he was nominated in February of 2009, he had been in office for less than two weeks. When he was declared the winner, he had been in office for approximately eight months. So he hadn't really started doing all the things that you know he he had mentioned in his speeches. You know uh, when he was campaigning for presidency, and so he was really given the prize um, for his potential for for what the committee was hoping he would accomplish, and also because he was. Um, the sort of the opposite in, in personality, in, in everything that he was saying to, to President w, uh, George W. Bush. So um, when, when some journalists were, were asking and sort of trying to dig into, you know, the, the, the committee chairman's uh, at the announcement of that year's price, they were sort of asking, so what has he actually done to deserve the price? Um, they couldn't really answer. And so the chairman finally said, we want to send a signal to the world. And that signal, what I discovered throughout my research, what was that that signal was actually, had actually nothing to do with, with Alfred Nobel and his intentions and hopes of, of peace and unity. That signal was that we do not appreciate or like the way um, George W. Bush has, has, you know, led the United States and been dealing with foreign countries throughout his presidency. Um, so we're giving this prize as a, as a slap in the face. And so, so, and, and it's funny that, you know, they are so arrogant and, and they believe, the committee believes that they answer to no one, that they can do exactly as they want, right? I mean, this, it's, it's just uh, shocking, really. And so, um, and so, uh, the Obama prize was actually the last in a in a in a series of prizes given out as a slap in President Bush's face, which is really does not belong in uh, in Peace Prize history, in in my opinion. And I'm showing behind me another controversial laureate. Uh, much more so than, yeah. uh, than of course, President Obama. And, and that is Aung San Suu Kyi, who won in 1991 the Nobel Peace Prize. And the question as to whether or not someone like her, who is currently under uh, international criminal court uh, suspicion or allegations, as, as they would say, of uh, participating, maybe sanctioning, maybe even condoning genocide. Now, nothing could be further from the lofty noble goals of Alfred Nobel than this. So why is it impossible to take away the Nobel Prize from somebody like this, if only to benefit the name and the monopoly status of the Nobel Prize Committee itself? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's really shocking to me. Um, so, so there has been demands before that the committee revoke a prize. 
and the committee has always refused to do so. Most of the time, they don't even respond to these demands, um, but sometimes they do. And the little they have said is that the winner was worthy of at the time we gave them the price. So we can't be responsible for or care about what they do after. It's basically the, basically their response. Um, when it comes to um, to the you know she's the leader of of, of Myanmar, um, Aung San Suu Kyi, and I mean it's just horrendous. We're talking genocide. She's responsible for for genocide, and. Um, I think it's a really disrespectful and it's 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 a disservice to not only to the Nobel Peace Prize as an institution, but also to the world to not revoke a prize when when um, a laureate takes such a, a dramatic turn to 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 uh, and and she and she probably will end up in prison as a as a as a war criminal. Um, along with, you know, uh, you know, other horrible uh, people responsible for genocide, uh, among them uh, Charles Taylor of um, of Liberia. Yeah, which is and, another interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that uh, Nobel Prize uh, to the uh, the first female vic uh, winner from Africa in the yeah. um, African president of Liberia? Yes, absolutely. So that was um, uh, in two thousand eleven. Um, former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf won the Peace Prize. And um, she was the first female president um, on the African continent. And she was, um, she was uh, you know, very much you know, promoted in, in the news. She was on the cover of Time Magazine. So she was, you know, promoted as this, and she, you know, obviously was a very powerful and is still a powerful woman. And um, so that year, the, the, the committee gave her the prize. Now, none of the experts on Liberia or Africa in the world actually understand why they gave her the prize. Because as, um, as when it comes to peace and creating stability, she has not done much according to these experts to, to deserve it. She has created the same kind of environment um, of, of leading with an iron fist as, you know, her predecessors. And she also um, was uh, funding, she was funding Charles Taylor and his revolution that led to genocide. So that woman actually has blood on her hands. Um, so it's, it's, it's and, and this is also something that is funny with the, with the work of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, and I believe it's the same with all the other uh, committees for the other prizes, Brian, is that we don't know what their, um, what their research is. We don't know actually how they're selecting, how they're deciding, because everything is so secret, right? So that's like one of the, the big issues that I have with the, the Peace Prize is all the secrecy. It doesn't belong in a world where we need to create, to, to restore trust. And, um, and also, I, I, I do um, commend the committee on, on wanting to select women and to, to you know, as, you know, you know and, and also uh, Black women and, and sort of minorities to, to, of course, we want to promote and get those players into uh, the field as well. As we, as we know from, from Bertha von Suttner, um, women are prominent in peace work around the world. And, you know, they should be awarded, not only men, um, but they're also not doing a service to women and, and honoring women when they select these types of women that have adopted a very sort of dysfunctional masculine leadership style, right? Like um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Ayun San uh, Suu Kyi as well uh, from Myanmar. That is really not, um, that is really actually devaluing women instead of honoring them. So, so yeah. yeah. And what do we think about this, this year's prize uh, for the World Food Program? Uh, I understand it's, you know, certainly a worthy cause, but the question that I had when I first heard about it is, you know, there's a lot of worthy causes. I 
you know, participate in, in charitable donations, et cetera, to programs like this. But I don't see it necessarily contributing to the reduction of armies, nor for the assembly of peace congresses, which are the two stipulations that Alfred Nobel had for the peace prize. So is it a, is it a feel good prize or is it a prize that actually is deserved as per the rules of the Nobel Peace Prize? Not, I'm not questioning its validity. Yeah, no, that's that's it's it, that's a great question as well because there's there's there are these I I when I when I um, sort of analyzed all the prices I um, I sort of put them into categories so so you have these you have the prices that are for good causes and good people and good organizations like the the World Food Program that are um, that are outside the scope of the instructions that Alfred Nobel gave in his last will. So it's, it, you're absolutely right. It's not, it does not contribute to you know, disarming our world and, and demilitarizing. It's, it's, it's poverty reduction, right? It's, it's distributing food, which is absolutely needed. And I believe po poverty reduction should probably be part of the Nobel Peace Prize. But when, if you, if the committee, if they want to expand on the scope of, of the price, that has to be done through proper legal channels because uh, it's a legal, a last will is a legal document. And then, so then they have to go to the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm, which is supposed to be supervising um, the committee's work, um, all the committee's works, you know, uh, in Sweden as well. Yeah. And they really haven't done so uh, until now. Or, or ever, um, so so if so so you have all these good prices. Um, I believe this year's prize is a is a perfectly um, good feel good as you say prize. It's a finalist prize. They don't take it. They're not taking any risk. It's hard to to criticize the World Food Program, right? When all these you know, millions of people are starving around the world. So um, it's it's it also comes. It's outside the scope. Um, but it, it also is a prize when we see last year's prize, for example, to, um, to Abi Ahmed, the Ethiopian prime minister. Um, he struck a, a peace accord with um, his, his neighboring country of Eritrea. And he's, uh, you know, he, he had lots of hopes for, for that laureate. But um, now it turns out that he hasn't managed to, I mean, his his country is in 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 still in, in in huge conflicts, you know, also within the country, and he hasn't done what he promised to do. So, so, and that the committee does that sometimes. It it will have an award that is oh uh, maybe we we weren't so lucky with that one. So then the next year they will sort of throw in a UN organization or some sort of organization that you can't really argue against, right? So they do that. You're muted, Sorry. right? There seems to be a kind of uh, uh, flip-flopping flip between <clears throat> uh, between um, prizes for celebrities or prizes yeah. for you know feel good that are incontrovertible. Uh, I want to ask about uh, sort of the propensity that the that the Nobel Prize Committee itself has to kind of promote itself or establish mm -hmm. itself politically. It's it's a very small country. How many? What is the population of Norway? We're just uh, 5 million people. 5 million, yeah. So it's, you know, 60 times smaller than the United States uh, mm -hmm. or, or even even less. And uh, so just a few percent. And yet they will have the influence on, and they clearly like to have influence in terms of, uh, you know, politics in, on the world stage, maybe repudiating, as you said, people like George Bush. And uh, I, I'd like to, you know, I could only imagine what the repudiations of Trump will be in the, in the future if they were that, uh, you know, strict on George W. Bush, uh, who is now held in much higher esteem than when he was president. Yeah. yeah. So what is it about the, uh, is there a need because it's kind of this, you know, tiny little country that they, uh, there's a saying in, uh, in, in my homeland of America, you know, the smallest dar dogs bark the loudest. I'm not comparing you to a dog, by the way, uh, just, <laughs> just, or Norway. Uh, but, um, but is it to get attention for the country? What does it mean to the, like when the holiday of Nobel's death day, October, uh, December 10th comes out, what is it like to the, to the kind of national character and, and how important is it politically internally? 
I mean, the Nobel Peace Prize is huge for Norway. It's really our, uh, you know, it's if it's if there's one thing that we're proud of, uh, apart from our um, skiers, you know, who win the Olympics, um, it's really the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, there is this need for this small nation that was so sort of suppressed, you know, for 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 more than 400 years under Denmark and Sweden, um, back in you know way back. Um, to really to to be in the arena to to be important and now of course you know it's it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world with with the with oil and uh, oil and gas and so it has it has this sort of need and we feel it and 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 I, I can't remember which uh, who said this is it, I believe it's a historian who said that peace is not a place for small egos. And it's, it's, it's so true. And it's also yeah. true for the committee. And I mean, and that's another thing with the Nobel Peace Prize, it's become really politicized. And because parliament selects the, the, the members of the committee, only politicians or, uh, or retired politicians sit on the committee. So of course, these politicians, they were selected not because of their um, their proven record in peace work, but for their long and loyal service to the, their political party. So you have this, this long string of, of, of uh, prices that further uh, Norwegian foreign policy or um, are given to strengthen ties with their allies, for example, the United States. And, and then you have also these prices that, as you mentioned, that sort of shed a light on Norway as a peace negotiator. Uh, for example, the, the, the award in 1994 to, uh, to Yasser Arafat, Shimon Peres, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, um, they, uh, that was given after they had signed the Oslo Peace Accords. So that was really negotiated and brokered by the Norwegian um, uh, government and uh, government officials. So, um, so of course they wanted to shed light on. Oh, look how look how great we are. We are peace champions ourselves. It, that's what it looks like. Um, and then, of course, yes, Sir Arafat at least was was certainly not a peace champion. I mean, he showed up to the peace uh, to the ceremony in December with. I mean, he was armed. You know, he was wearing his 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 pistol. And of course he had to remove it, you know, before he entered the, the ceremony hall because guns are illegal. You can't carry, carry a gun in Norway, that's illegal. So, you know, he was cert has certainly showed uh, that he was not a peace champion before and he certainly didn't become a peace champion after the award either. So, you know, um, there's that. And there was also another one um, in, in, in more recent in 2016 when they gave it to um, the president of Colombia um, uh, Santos, President Santos, uh, and then for his uh, for his sort of yeah peace peace agreement with the Farcs of uh, of Colombia. Now that year, that was also the Norwegians were also helping in, in brokering that peace accord. Now that year they didn't give it to the Farcs, right? So you know, like you wonder why would they give it to Yasser Arafat back in in ninety four, but not to the Farcs. In 2016, you know, we don't really know. Um, a part of the secrecy again, they don't have to explain themselves. They don't have to justify anything. Um, the information doesn't even have to be released until 50 years after the fact. So that is really frustrating that we don't know. Which is, you know, not increasing trust again. No, the, oh. lack, the lack of transparency is yeah. is really egregious. Um, I want to make a call to action for those listening that want to ask questions uh, for Uni about the Peace Prize, about uh, or about even her previous book, which she spoke about, The Mystery of the Lone Wolf Killer. Uh, I'd like to uh, start, um, you know, prompting you to start thinking of questions for Uni. I have uh, one more for myself. I actually don't know if we're going to, Colleen, can you let me know how the 
format is? Are people going to type it in the chat and then that's and I'll select them or how do you want to do that? Uh, Colleen, you can just message me privately as I multitask. Uh, I'm capable of doing that. Yes, I remember, you know, speaking of the kind of, you know, uh, unusual ceremony that Yasser Arafat came to, I remember somebody saying once, you know, I'd kill for a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and uh, it's something that, you know, people really want to have uh, fixation on as, as if, as I contend in the science prizes, it's sort of an idol that scientists are comfortable worshiping, even though most of them are irreligious or anti-religious. Um, I want to know, uh, why does it really matter to you personally in the mission of the book? You explained, you know, how you came to it, but um, other than being Norwegian and having a great deal of national pride, deservedly so, uh, is there, you know, is, is there another motive or what do you hope to um, have as the lasting impact of betraying the Nobel? So I, I believe that the Nobel Peace Prize as an institution, it might, it might seem irrelevant in today's world, but I believe it has a function. I believe it, it can again be the beacon of hope and inspiration that Alfred Nobel really wanted it to be. And what he wanted for all of his prizes, right? Not just the Peace Prize, but for all of his prizes. And to really um, um, be for the betterment of humanity. He used that, that wording in his last will. And so what, what I'm hoping, I'm hoping that through perhaps, you know, international pressure, more people being aware of, of what they're doing. Um, I think it's, it's, it's our job as citizens to put our leaders on notice, telling them that, okay, we see what you're doing and we're not happy about it. And you're not creating trust and you're not creating connection and you're, you're, actually contributing to a more polarized world. And so I'm hoping that there's, that they will, um, there is, are easy steps that they can make to actually restore trust in the Nobel Peace Prize. They can make the, the whole process transparent. They don't have to continue with the secrecy. There's nothing in the last will of Alfred Nobel that said that this has to be secret. That is a rule that they have made up themselves. So it doesn't have to be secret. They can also uh, define peace. They can also define peace for us and tell us this is the types of work that we want to include in the prize. And, and so that we know and we are sort of prepared for the, the, the kinds of awards that they are going to give, um, which will give more predictability and, and also um, uh, help to restore trust. And um, in this polarized world that we're seeing, it's just, I feel that it's just, more important than ever, that we have at least one institution that can uphold these values and um, and this sort of very disenfranchised enfranchised world that we can um, restore some of that trust yes, and yes. Uh, and 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 give you know and and give us some inspiration. Select some some leaders that inspire us to be better people, all of us as, as individuals. Um, and, yeah. and, and also, I'm hoping that they will be also a little courageous in their choices and not always selecting, not that they always do, but they tend to select a lot of heads of state yes. or, or so, you know, people who are already, you know, celebrities, they have a platform. So they don't really need the Nobel Peace Prize and the prestige and the money and everything that comes with it to do their work. But perhaps some of these people that do great work, and there are people out there who do great work, but they would really benefit from the platform of the Nobel Peace Prize, right? Yeah. So that's really what I'm hoping. And that could leverage it to not only a uh, good effect for the world, but to benefit and rehabilitate the Nobel Prize's somewhat tarnished legacy. There's a question in the chat about the 1974 Peace Prize that went to uh, Henry Kissinger and his uh, North Vietnamese counterpart. Uh, wow. Can you say something about that and how one of them accepted it and uh, used it for his own purposes, so to speak, and the other one refused it? Yeah, that's it's, that's really one of the most e egregious uh, awards, in my opinion. Um, I mean, there was no peace accord, and in, in I mean, peace the, the peace wasn't established. They had sort of they had some preliminary preliminary agreements, but it hadn't really been signed. 
uh, or actually it hadn't been signed. And, and the leader of, of North Vietnam, he refused to come to Oslo to receive this prize. Now, the funny thing about that year is that, um, and he's the only one who's ever refused the peace prize, by the way. Um, and, but the committee, to the committee, he's still a winner of the peace prize because they rejected his refusal. So on a peace, you know, in peace prize history and on the record, he's still a winner of the peace prize. Isn't that funny? So mm -hmm. you cannot reject. They will not allow you to reject. Um, they will give it to you anyway, even if you refuse to take it. So, and of course, Kissinger, he, he um, received his, and that was really um, just shocking. You know, I mean, the US, uh, I mean, he was basically uh, carpet bombing uh, Vietnam and Cambodia while, you know, they were, you know, handed the price, right? So it was, it was really um, shocking, but, you know, it was given in 1973, 73, I believe, and that was what we have to remember about that year was that it was during the Cold War. And so Norway was yet again seeking to strengthen political ties with the United States, which is the most important ally for Norway. I mean, Norway, we're, rushing, we're bordering to Russia, sorry, uh, in the north and has a very strategic coastline. And, and um, Russia has, has, you know, every now and then Russia is sort of like hinting that they would love to take over and invade Norway. So, you know, it's, it's for us, it's very useful to have the United States as an ally and be in NATO. And, and you know, um, when, when, by the way, when, when Trump sort of threatened, you know, a few years ago that he would pull the United States out of, of NATO, uh, Norway was uh, literally shaking. So, yeah. So it is important to strengthen ties. So that was one of those, one of those awards. All right, good. Um, so we have a few more minutes if people want to ask questions for Uni while you have the opportunity to speak with this brilliant author about a very important book. <clears throat> um, in addition to, you know, kind of the more egregious uh, prizes, I think uh, it might be interesting to think about, you know, again, this is kind of fan fiction, but to think about Alfred Nobel as a person and how he'd react if he did come to a dinner party you know, hosted by you and me, say, and and learned of what's happened to the to the prizes, both the addition of prizes he never authorized, like the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, which which I believe Michael's uh, brother Peter Nobel has spoken adamantly and vehemently against, uh, against, and and that his great grand uncle would be appalled by. Um, Another type of betrayal is, is sort of against what uh, you know what, what we might say is his his intentions not only as a donor but just as an as an individual. The portrait that you paint of him is very sympathetic. I mean, one of the quotes that I love is is he says uh, and you quote I'm a misanthrope yet I am utterly benevolent. I have more than one screw loose yet I am a super idealist who digests philosophy more efficiently than food. I just wonder what he would really think about. Uh, this this prize that bears his name, and then we have a couple more questions from the audience. Yeah, I would love to sit at a you know a dinner with him and just pick his brains because I mean that man was was brilliant and uh, and so um, and not only in science he was so interested in literature. Um, he actually wanted to be a writer and a poet when he was growing up, but his father didn't didn't think that that was a, a worthy profession. So. He, he sort of let that go, but he, he still like, sort of secretly loved to read and write and, uh, and, uh, and it, you know, it would be so interesting to, to ask him all these questions. I believe he, he is probably turning in his grave if, you know, if that's even a thing, but he's, what has happened to his, to his prices. And, and I think not only the Peace Prize, right? I think, uh, Brian, you have some, some, also some great examples in your book on, in, in the science prices, right? Yeah. Of, of people who should not, like who were not worthy winners and, and, all, and others like yourself that have been ignored, which is, you know, uh, really um, uh, appalling. Yeah, I just see it as self-destructive. Ultimately, the suggestions that you and I are making are the cri de cour to reform it for its own benefit because it has such an outsized influence 
on society. Um, I want to close mm-hmm. with a final question. Uh, where where do you go to next besides hopefully to bed? It's uh, almost four in the morning there. I'm sure you have a lot more media appearances today, but I hope you'll get some rest. So where do you go when this, what's your ultimate goal at the mission and how can we, why can we help besides buying many copies of the book? Um, thank you for that. I think, uh, well, my work is I, I love writing, so I'm going to continue writing, of course, and speaking as long as people want to want to hear hear me talk. Um, my uh, what I do aside from 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 working on this and, and and talking about the peace price is really, I think it's so important for women to really step up into um, leadership in their corporations, in politics, and I'm I'm thrilled for uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, you know, as, as, you know, future vice president. Um, I think it's so important not only to, to step up into leadership as women, to pr- really p- participate and be in the arena, but for us to bring in um, a different side of, of, of sort of leadership style, to bring in our, our, our feminine qualities and not just be replicas of men, because, I mean, we have, we have enough men in leadership and, and, and men can be great leaders too, that's not the question, but we need this sort of female energy and, and, and female power into leadership. So, so, what, I, so what I do uh, apart from that is I work with women on you know, owning their feminine power and um, bringing that in with them wherever they are in societies, in our, in our families, in communities, in, in corporations and, and politics. So, so that's something that, and, and to that, I actually have, um, a free gift. It's a download that for anyone listening to this uh, can download uh, and just click on the link. I believe Colleen, you will put the the link in the in the in the notes uh, probably that they can just go in there, download it, and um, and use that to sort of. It's it's mostly for women, but of course men are also welcome to to download and also to share it with anyone who who would um, would want to. Yeah, well, uh, I speak from experience. It will bring you peace if not particularly your own peace prize. Yeah. Winnie Turatini, I want to thank you so much for being so gracious and generous with your time and sharing your wisdom uh, with all of us at the Battery tonight. And I wish you uh, a blissful night of sleep, first of all, and then second of all, continued strength uh, in all your future work. Thank you, Brian. I'm so honored and so grateful to have you here and have this conversation with you. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Thank Colin. you both so much for doing this tonight. Thank you. Um, drop the link of the book if you want to purchase Uni's book, Betray the Noble, in the chat, along with the gift uh, with the meditation download she mentioned. And we'll follow up with the recording tonight and a link to the book in an email um, in a couple of days. You'll take care. Come see us in San Francisco next time you're in town. Yes, absolutely. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Thank Hopefully. you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.